There are three things every person seeks to know. No matter what age you are, these three things captivate your life. The first is your identity. Who am I? It's a question we all ask each other. Ask ourselves, I mean. Who am I? That identity. Number two, belonging. Where do I fit in where I'm going to be loved? And number three, purpose. What is the meaning of my life? No matter what age you're dealing with those things, and the beautiful thing is when you come to Christ, you find that your identity is found in him. I am a Christian. I am belonging to this thing called the family of Christ, the, the body of Christ, his church in a big way. But sometimes as believer, we struggle with purpose. What am I supposed to do here? And sometimes it's purpose in the big picture. Sometimes it's purpose in the small ways, trying to figure out God's will for my life right here and right now. And sometimes we can approach it kind of like, remember the magic eight ball? Those of you that grew up in the 80s, I heard it's even before that. I'm a product of the 80s. But we'd sit there and we'd sit there and go, all right, am I supposed to marry this person? Don't count on it. Rats. Okay, let's try it again. Ask again later. Come on. Am I supposed to go to work today? And we shake it as I see it. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Am I supposed to go to church today? You're the pastor. Oh, man. Those things happen in life. We sit there and we'll kind of, you know, this modern day, it's what? Siri. Hey, Siri, how, how about this? What am I supposed to do? And we want to know our purpose and the beautiful thing is that I believe God has given us clarity in his word to show us these things about his will for our life. We've studied through the first eight chapters of Romans. They deal with doctrine. We learned about how through the blood of Christ we are justified, just as if I'd never sinned. We've been forgiven. We learned how to live and walk in this thing called sanctification, which simply means set apart or holiness. What, what does it look like to be led by the Spirit? It was doctrinal. And then in chapters 9 through 11, we turn to more dispensational, which we saw how God works with Israel, both his past, present, and future work, that Israel one day will experience the things that we are experiencing now uh, as part of the body of Christ, connected with Christ. But now in chapters 12 through the end of the book, he deals with practical. You see, the things, the doctrine that we learned and the example that's been set has to find its way into the practical outworking of my life. And so it's practical Christianity. And so we're going to study in chapter 12 how to, how to serve one another, how to uh, deal with those who you might have problems with inside the body of Christ or outside the body of Christ. We're going to learn in chapter 13, dealing with the Christian and how they relate to government. Ooh, that's a big one today. We're going to learn in chapter 14 and 15 of how do you deal with those debatable issues within Christianity uh, that people have. And in chapter 16, we're going to see the outworking of love that flows through ministry. There's good things ahead in, in Christian living, but here is the key. The key to the next four chapters is verses one and two, which we're going to focus on this morning. And here is the reason why. All these other things are spokes to the hub of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to focus on, the hub of Jesus Christ. The spokes of these issues, the transforming impact of Christ on us, that we don't want to be so focused on the spokes, the issues around us, that we miss the hub of Jesus Christ, which is God's will for our life. Can I really know? Yes. Let's check it out. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is key, and this is why we need to spend some time in it. What is God's will for my life? Well, as we see there in our, in our verses, number one, if we kind of work backwards a little bit, God's will for my life 
is first good, acceptable, and perfect. I've got to come to the understanding of that. God's will for my life is good, acceptable, and perfect. It's not always fun, comfortable, and easy. When we moved to China in 2009, it was not fun, comfortable, and easy, but it was God's will that was beneficial, fully acceptable, and perfect to mature us in Christ. God is not out to confuse you. Remember that. He's the author of peace. He's not out to make you dizzy with all kinds of doubts and fears. No, he, he's the God of truth. He came to seek and save the lost ultimately. He knows his plans for you are good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. And in the first thing, in knowing God's will for my life, I have to fall back on what God has revealed in his word. Why? Because God will never direct you in a way that's contrary to what he's already spoken in his word. And so I need to note that. I need to be in it. John 6, verses 28 and 29, here is one of the things of God's will for your life, to believe in Jesus. The people said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? They're wanting to know, what's the will of God in my life? What does he want me to do? And he says real clear, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Okay, that's what the Lord wants in my life, for me to believe him. It's part of his will for me. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, sanctification and holy living is part of his will. For this is the will of God. Paul writes, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. And there is a point at which I must believe that what God has said is what he's saying now. That it's true. And there are times when it doesn't make sense. I understand that. You know, Psalms 13. Listen to this psalm. I was reading it this morning. It says, oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? You ever felt like that? I just don't know what you're doing, God. How long will you look the other way as if you're turning your back on me? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? I mean, life's falling apart for the psalmist. Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. <gasps> Look at verse five. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. Listen, when your heart begins to say, how long? Faith needs to rise up and say, I will trust. I will rejoice. I will sing. Why? When you don't see what he's doing, when his will isn't clear, you gotta fall back on what you know to be true. And that is this. He loves me, he saved me, and he is good to me. So I need to understand that God's will for me is good, acceptable, and perfect. Number two, I need to understand that God's will for me is discovered with some discernment. Look at what he says again in verse two. He says that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that word prove, it means to test, to examine, to be found approved. Now, if you go down Happy Valley Road and you go for the longest time out, you'll hit Whitman. And out in Whitman, there is the Ford Proving Grounds. They are testing their vehicles. They are proving not how bad their vehicles are, but the worth of their vehicles through a testing ground. And there are times in life where the Lord uh, says it's time to prove and discern my will, not to go contrary to it, but to find myself the worth and the value in it to walk in obedience. And the reality is sometimes we don't know exactly what God's will is in a particular situation. It's kind of fuzzy. We find ourselves waiting upon God. And God allows those things to be fuzzy so that we would use discernment, we would use patience, and we would fall back upon his word. I think about a guy like Jonathan. Jonathan in chapter uh, 14 of 1 Samuel, him and his armor bearer, the Israelites were facing the Philistines, the enemies, and Jonathan said to his armor bearer, hey, let's go see. Let's go. Let's go into battle. Who's to say that God can't save by many or few? And the armor bearer said, man, do all that's in your heart. Let's go for it. And so they got to this place. They fell back on what they knew to be true about God. 
And they got to this place and they said, all right, here's what we're going to do. If they say, wait there, we'll come down to you, then we're going to stay put. God's not directing us. If they say, come on up here, I'm going to show you a thing or two, then we're going to know the battle's ours. And Jonathan and his armor bearer, they went there. And all of a sudden, the Philistines and their pride say, hey, come on up here, you, you pip squeaks. That's my version. We're going to show you a thing or two and give you a licking and send you back home to your mama. And, and so they get up there, and they're full of faith, and they, they kill this battle. They just start slaughtering and doing these, this great victory through two guys. I'm sure at some point they took a selfie and Instagrammed it, hashtag killing it, or something like that along the way to tell their buddies what's going on. You see, they discern the will of God through even a testing, a proving. When it's not clear, in those fuzzy times, I have to fall back on who God is. I got to lean on his word in the moment. And I got to ask for wisdom in moving forward one step at a time. Listen to what the Bible says, James 1, 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally or freely, and without reproach, there's no shame in it, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, tossed, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. So God's saying, listen, you, you, I want to tell you my will for your life. I want you to ask. When it's fuzzy and not clear, I want you to ask, and I, I want to tell you what the next steps are or what I have planned for you, but you've got to believe in who I am and what I've revealed already in my word. Don't be wishy-washy. not going to get anywhere. Just washed on the shores. I found in my life, I have this little saying that really helps me at times. If it's clear, then hear. If it's gray, then stay. And what that means for, for me is that if it's clear in God's word, I just need to hear it. Listen, I don't need to pray about it when the Lord says, hey, don't murder. Hmm, gosh, I just don't know if I should do that. I'm really feeling like that's the will of God. I need to take somebody out. <laughs> no, 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 the Bible's very clear. You would go, duh. But there are those gray issues that the Bible allows the Holy Spirit to direct you and lead you in your life. For example, people say, wait, is it suits or shorts on Sunday? I don't know. I'm wearing jeans. You know, it, it, but you might say, hey, you know, I want to give God my best on Sunday morning, so I'm going to dress up. Go for it. Well, you know, I've had such a hard week. It's just I want to relax, and he knows my heart. Then go for it. The moment we start turning it into rules, we start killing off life. The moment we make it all about obeying the rules, checking off the to-do list, we kill off life. We need to give space in the gray areas for the Holy Spirit to direct you in the will of God. That's hard because that means I need to listen to the Lord. I need to cultivate relationship with the Lord. I can't just have a religiosity with God. I need to have a relationship Number three, God's will for my life is to be consecrated to him, to be dedicated fully to the Lord. Look at verse one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul uses this word, parakaleo. I beg of you. I urge you. I, I entreat you. I beg of you because of God's mercy shown to us in bringing us into his family to consecrate your life to the Lord. I'm earnestly, passionately pleading with you, dedicate your life to the Lord. He isn't saying, well, I kind of have something you might consider. No. He is getting right to the point to say, here is the reality of chapters 1 through 11 and all the ways that God has been merciful to us. I'm begging you, dedicate your life to the Lord. There are some things worth begging for, begging believers for. Paul's not ashamed to, to be at this place because he knows it's right. It's an honorable thing. It's right for us to beg one another to say, I want you to allow the mercies of God to change your life daily. That's a right thing. It's right for us to beg one another to love 
one another as Jesus commanded us in John 13, 34, and 35. And sometimes that means dying to yourself and asking forgiveness and reconciling and working in such a way and serving others. Those are good things for us to beg for. It's right for us to beg for unity in the body of Christ because there's so many things to tear it apart and destroy the body of Christ and the witness to the world and the enemy just laughs at the whole thing. It's right for us to beg for that to maintain unity. It's right for us to let God's word direct your life and, and beg for that. The living word of God that's sharper than a two-edged sword needs to be in your life, directing your life. It's right for us to beg for you to pray for others. Paul said this, Romans 15, 30. I, now I beg you, brethren. This is the great apostle Paul begging us. Through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. It's right for us to beg to use discernment. Romans 16, 17, Paul writes again. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. He says don't get in an argument with them, just avoid them. And here in Romans 12, it is good, it is right to beg for a consecrated life for his purpose. He says that you may present your bodies a living sacrifice. We may beg, but you still have to make the choice. And God always honors the will. Our, our life to discover God's will, lay yourself on the altar. That's your part. God's part, bring in the flame. And the picture is an Old Testament burnt offering. There they would take the animal into the courts of the Lord. And the animal would not be sliced and diced and, and put the parts on. The whole thing would just be like, kerplunk, it's all yours, God. Burn it up. Take it all. And that's kind of the attitude or the picture of the burnt offering, wholly dedicated to the Lord, presenting our bodies. So often, we will allow our body to determine direction rather than the will my will says, I want to dedicate my life to the Lord, though my body says, uh, uh. But as Paul says, hey, don't be driven by your body appetites. Let the will in alignment with the Lord do what is right. And that's what he says. Let me tell you this. It is God's will for you and me to say, Lord, I'm all in. I am all in, Lord. That's what God's after in your life looking throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts would be turned towards him. That's what God's after. There are so many things that hold us back from going all in. There could be worry. What if? What about? What would they think? There could be sin. It trips us up from experiencing all God has for us. And some people just aren't willing to let it go. It's kind of the Linus blanket that helps make them feel secure, though it's kind of killing them. And sometimes there's just unbelief. You see, there's a part of you and I that says, if I go all in, what if God leaves me on that altar bound up and bleeding, but there's no fire that comes? And the unbelief keeps us from going all in. Here's the problem. It's a living sacrifice, right? It's a living sacrifice, which means at times a uh, sacrifice normally would be killed, put on the altar, and Paul says, no, you're living sacrifice, so you can actually get off the altar. <laughs> the will. Listen, the here I am today is never met with a maybe tomorrow in God's book. When you say, Lord, I'm all in, God's going to say, okay, take a number. He says, all right, I've got a vessel to work in. Don't worry about the fears. Don't worry about the issues. God can handle all those things. He's looking for the heart that says, Lord, I'm all in. It's been said God takes full responsibility for the man who wholly surrenders to the Lord. And you need a Jesus take the wheel moment. Now's the day. You need a time to say, God, I'm all in for you. I'm letting all this stuff go. I'm dedicating my life to you. Today's the day. But God's even after more. Because it's not about what was once and done, it's about what is now and here on out. That's what the Lord's looking for. Consecration to God is not a dead end in life, but an open door to more life. I found this in my own life personally. I've seen those times. Maybe you've experienced those times. It was back in the 90s when I just I found myself saying, Lord, I'm just all in. 
And I began to watch the Lord open up crazy doors of life, you know, sharing the gospel all over the, the earth in various places, watching people's lives just be healed from the destruction of sin and being with believers at their very last breaths to, to help usher them into the kingdom. Listen, there's a point at which I, I just go, wow, I'm overwhelmed that, Lord, you're that good. And if you said, hey, it's time to come home, there isn't nothing left that I'm longing to do. The Lord is the fullness of life. It really is a beautiful thing how it works. But it's not just a living sacrifice. Notice it's holy and acceptable one to God. The all in is met with alignment with God's word. It has to be according to his word. 1 Corinthians 13, 3 says, though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, profits me nothing. I need to do things according to as God's word says. I can make sacrifices every day. I can say, hey, look at the brownie points I've got. Hey, hey I'm, I'm, I may make sacrifices to manipulate others or even to do certain things or for others to look at my life. And the survey says, eh, you know, it ain't happening in God's book. It's because of the love of God. It's because of the blood of Christ that it has made a way for me as a sinner to be right with God positionally that I may be useful for his kingdom practically. The first has to come. And he, Paul says it's a reasonable service or a duty to God. It just makes sense in light of who he is. Fascinating word reasonable is logikos, meaning of the word. A life that is of the word is in alignment with God and it'll be used by God. A worship life is aligned with the word of God. Lesson number four, that God's will for my life is really to be transformed by him. Look at verse two. He says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Conformed means to be fashioned into the pattern. The thinking, the actions, the world, meaning of this age is what it means. The world wants to squeeze me into its mold. It wants to tell me, don't make a big deal about Jesus, make a bigger deal about yourself. Amen. <laughs> it has a conforming aspect. And that mindset is contrary to what God wants for your life and my life. You have to ask yourself, am I being transformed am I, or am I conforming? Great picture is the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. Two different things. The thermometer basically adjusts to its surroundings, whether it's hot or cold, right? But the thermostat changes the surroundings, dictates what the surroundings will be. You can stat that. Thermostat is what we're after. To transform. It's a fascinating word. It's the word metamorpho. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. And it really means to change from one thing to another. Now, I'm a product of the 80s. You know, I, I, I grew up with, with uh, stomper trucks and Velcro shoes and a killer Tari 6400 if you're into video games. But one of the things I remember very well, and they're even still hot today, is Transformers, right? These little, these little robots, these little vehicles that are robots in disguise and, you know, Optimus Prime taking on the Decepticons and the whole issue there, they could transform into these robots. And, and uh, of course, now they make movies on them and stuff like that. But the whole idea of transforming uh, didn't start there. You and I become uh, a transformed person in light of the work of the gospel. Uh, we are, are not just robots without a will. No, we have a will, but we're saying I, I surrender to Christ that he would do in my life what I cannot do for myself, that he would find purpose and meaning and I would have a work and a worth far greater than anything else. The love of Christ transforms us. And, and the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. The old has passed away, all things have become new. I have been changed. I have been transformed. There's a metamorphosis in my life. But what's fascinating is this word metamorpho is found in two other places in the New Testament. The first is in Matthew 17, dealing with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
And there his appearance transformed and his clothing became white as light, glowing before the disciples. The second place is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Look at what it says. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's what happens to us when we spend time with the Lord. It's the beautiful thing, how this transformation occurs. First, we give our bodies to him as a living sacrifice. I'm going to worship you, Lord, verse 1. And then we take, Lord, my mind to be renewed in your word, verse 2, that you would tr transform me. And the renewing means renovating, like redoing a house. A fixer-upper is on. And, and, and everything is, the old is moved out. The new is in place. There's a renewing. And what we find is we renew our lives by the word of God. But listen, listen, this is key. The word of God has one goal and one purpose, Jesus. You ever realize that? You ever stop to consider that? That from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, it is all about Jesus. He is the Lord at creation at the beginning. He is the end of the law, the first five books. He is the song of all the Psalms as they go. And he's the point of all prophecy. He's the man that we get to in the Gospels. He's the message that we preach in the book of Acts. He's the meaning and the method for Christian living in all the letters. And in the end, in Revelation, he is what? The King of kings and Lord of lords, the one that's coming to make all things new. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. Psalm says, the volume of the books, it was written of me. It points us to Jesus. Now, here is the key. Here is the thing. The problem is, many times we'll go to Bible study or to church to figure out, how do I fix my family? How, how do I deal with my finances? How, how do I, what am I supposed to do about work? That's spoke life, bro. Hub. Jesus. You need Jesus. That's it. That's the key. That's the goal to everything. Because all those things, you may learn about all those things and it gives you an intellectual knowledge, but it doesn't lead to a transformation in your life. I know all about the Bible. I know all what I'm supposed to do. But something's still missing. Why is there not a transformation? Because you're focused on the spokes and not the hub. I just need Jesus. More of Jesus. It's Jesus that brings the transformation and the word points us to Jesus and then we can live unveiled with nothing to hide. You see, this past week, I found myself in this place of saying, Lord, I, I know many times I know you intellectually, but I want to know you relationally even more. And in my devotions, I happen to be reading Song of Solomon, saucy book. It's about a king and his love for a, a, a woman and their interactions. But the reality is, ultimately it is, it's a picture of our King of Kings and his love for you and I called the Bride of Christ. And as I'm reading through this book, oh my goodness, incredible how relational God is and his view of you and I. And he saw, sees you as beautiful, you're his treasure, that he loves you. I mean, it's just fascinating relational that it was, I mean, I'm, my Song of Solomon is now all read in my Bible. And I encourage you, read the word of God with relationship in mind, not intellect in mind. Study the word of God with intellect, but just read it in your devotions with relationship in mind. And allow the word of God to transform your life. What's God's will for my life? Quite simple, Jesus. That's it. Everything is found in him. In troublesome times here, we seek answers. We want to know what's the next direction to take. What's the purpose? What's the next step? What's the quick fix? And there were the disciples, John chapter 14, a little troubled, a little disturbed, a little wondering what's going on. Jesus says, don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he goes on and talks to them about mansions. And one of the disciples says, where are you going? I don't know where you're going and how do we get there? And what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You see, his point was, it's not information that you need, 
but it's me that you need. You're, you're wanting direction? I'm the way. Keep your eyes focused on me. You're wanting truth? Check it out. Back here. You're wanting life? No, no, no. Go, don't go to all the spokes. Come back here to me. And it always is the case in our life. The more of Jesus we get, the more rest and peace and life we're going to experience. I delight myself in the Lord, and he takes care of the issues. I find that he's a great shepherd, and he's going to lead where he wants to lead. My part is not to figure it all out, but just to surrender consecration to him, transformation by him, discerning and knowing his will is good and his word is right. I don't have to struggle with, am I in the will of God? No, because I'm in Jesus. I already am in his will. The rest is just letting his spirit lead. If you need help on that, go back to Romans chapter eight. Do you know Christ in such a way as we close out that it's all more of Jesus in my life? I just want more of Jesus. That's it. And I'll tell you, that's the purpose of the church. It's the purpose of the church. The spokes are social issues, spiritual issues, family issues, financial issues. Those are all just spokes. But if we miss the hub, then we're missing the whole purpose. And that's why the first two verses are so important because the rest of the chapter and the chapters following are just spokes. When the life is consecrated to him, when the person is being transformed by him, when Jesus is the hub and the center of it all, the goal to get to, you're going to see all this other stuff start falling into place.